Hey everyone, welcome back to our hardware news video for the last week where we're mostly focusing on deceitful and or confusing GPU naming from both NVIDIA and AMD, like the new GT1030 that uses DDR4 memory and has slower clock speeds. So we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about that one, uh, an alleged AMD RX 500X, which is not that alleged because they did accidentally post it on their own official website, and some stuff about Micron's new fabs. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA Z10 mechanical keyboard. The EVGA Z10 includes a small display readout top and center, capable of providing hardware monitoring information and EVGA precision statistics. The board ships with either MX Brown or MX Blue switches, offers a column of programmable macro keys, a volume slider, a dimmer, and a detachable wrist rest. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this first news item is about the GT1030 with DDR4. We've railed against AMD and Nvidia both in the past for this. Most recently from each company, AMD had their RX 560 that had fewer compute units than the actual RX 560 that everyone reviewed at launch. They basically, well, no, they literally rebranded an RX 460 as a 560 with fewer CUs. NVIDIA had the GTX 1060 3 gigabyte card, which is fine if it were just 3 gigabytes, but in actuality, it also cut 10% of its simultaneous multiprocessors. So we've talked about this before, but it's time to talk about it again, unfortunately. Just to remind everyone, previously with the GTX 1060 3 gigabyte card, we had this to say about it in the review. We said, it's just not a GTX 1060, it's a different product. NVIDIA's choice to name the card as such will confuse buyers into thinking that it's just a 1060 with half the VRAM, which is plainly false. This is a GTX 1050 Ti. A quick side note, this is before 1050 Ti's came out. And NVIDIA decided not to call it that. It's a marketing play. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. All these companies make marketing plays. But this isn't one that we can brush aside as harmless because users will inevitably make the incorrect assumption that only VRAM is the difference. Well, it's happening again. This time the GT1030 is the subject. And for this one, they've made quite a few changes. One of them is moving from GDDR5 to DDR4. Another one is the clock change in base and boost clock. So, a couple things here. It's still BGA modules soldered to the board. We're not talking DDR4 so damn sticks or something like that. It's actually, it's just soldered to the board. The only difference is it's not GDDR5. This is of course significantly slower than GDDR5. It has different latencies, worse latencies. The new GT1030 also has lower clocks. It's 1151 megahertz as the new base and 1379 to 1430 as the new boost. Previously, these clocks were 1227 for base, and 1468 to 1518 MHz for boost. Pretty big difference. And a couple things here. You could argue that the memory change going to DDR4 from GDDR5 on a card which is inherently restricted by the core, not necessarily the memory, is not a big deal. You could argue that. And you might even be right. Maybe it's not a big deal. We haven't actually tested it. What's less arguable are two other things. One, the clock speed change will impact performance. And two, it's irrelevant whether you can argue that the change isn't a big deal anyway, because the product is different. It doesn't matter how that difference is realized in performance, it's not the same product. And that impacts everybody. That impacts buyers, particularly at the low end, which are likely to be newcomers to the market, who look up reviews from people like us, see a GT1030, see performance metrics, buy a GT1030, not knowing it has DDR4 and slower clock speeds, and get worse performance. That reflects poorly on us. It reflects poorly on NVIDIA. It confuses the buyers, and you end up with an ecosystem that is just really unnecessarily confusing and potentially unintentionally or intentionally deceitful. That's a lot of shillies in one sentence, but either way, you get the point. So NVIDIA here, and let's, let's take their GPP post at face value. Let's take that blog post, face value, nothing weird's going on, the hard OCP story never came out, we're in a universe where GPP went up on NVIDIA's blog, it was ignored because it was a company blog and everyone really didn't know any better. Well, okay, so if we take NVIDIA's version of GPP at face value and we ignore all the, the extra information around it, then what we're left with is a program which claims to clarify the market for buyers. It claims to make it easier for a buyer to understand what they're getting. 
Well then, that's pretty contradictory to launching a GT1030 that has a completely different memory subsystem, it has completely different memory, it has different clock speeds. The only thing that's not different is the core count or the vector count as it were. So uh, this is something that is complete and utter bullshit and we find wholly unacceptable. It was unacceptable when AMD did it with the RX 560. It was unacceptable when Nvidia did it with a GTX 1063 gigabyte that had 10% fewer SMs, and it's unacceptable now with the GT 1030. This is a problem. It reflects poorly on everybody in the industry. The only person who really loses is, at the face of it, going to be the consumer who buys it expecting a different card. And even if the performance is equivalent, let's just pretend it's exactly the same. It's irrelevant. The product is not the same product. So it doesn't get the same name. This is a GT 1020, not a GT 1030. It is inherently a cheaper product to build and should be branded as a different product line that is cheaper to buy. So, uh, very unhappy with the GT 1030. And this is getting to a boiling point where we've got both AMD and Nvidia rebranding cards into things that they are not and they're selling them to people who don't understand what's going on. So that's a problem. That's not something that uh, we can accept. It's not something that we will stand by and watch. It's complete bullshit. And just to be clear here, again, a 100 megahertz clock swing is measurable. I can measure that difference in performance. And we will as soon as we can find the cards and buy them. So very strange, it's very strange behavior by Nvidia. They're in a domineering position. They don't need to do this. They could launch this product as a GT 1020 if they wanted to, and it'd still be, it'd be fine. I would have ignored it completely. You'd never hear about it from me, but we also wouldn't be bashing it because it wouldn't be inherently deceitful whether or not Nvidia means for it to be. So uh, Nvidia and AMD, because if any AMD employees are watching and laughing at your uh, opposition getting slammed right now, I'd like to remind you that you've done the same thing. Just please stop. The RX 560 using rebranded RX 460s with fewer CUs than were announced when the AMD product page at launch had a specified CU count which was later changed silently to have a an OR in there, CUs X or Y. That's not okay. It's not okay that the GT 1030 exists either. And I, I, I'm going to keep doing this until it stops, which is going to be never. So expect to see this again. But uh, yeah, in other news, NVIDIA announced a new GT 1020 with DDR4 memory. And uh, if you'd like to buy one, we suggest that you don't. Next news item, AMD is preparing new GPUs. <sighs> Just had this discussion. So AMD's got new GPUs. Uh, this is the RX 500X series. In fairness, putting an X at the end is at least a different letter. They've, they've added a character to the name, so there's some differentiation between A and B here. But earlier this week, AMD accidentally posted a new Radeon RX 500X category on their official website before its prompt removal, by the way. The RX 500X series is rumored to be a refresh, unsurprisingly, on Polaris, the RX 500 series, which was a refresh on Polaris, the RX 400 series. And so it's a, it's a re-refresh. And uh, that, as a refresher of history of refreshes, the RX 580, 570, and so forth were basically pre-overclocked 400 series cards with a more mature process. They could handle slightly higher frequencies. They were also given lifted voltage limits in overclocking tools. So as an overclocker, you could increase the voltage on the card so you could overclock past the pre-overclock. So at the end of the day, you ended up with actually a pretty decent product although very power hungry for something like an RX 580, even compared to an RX 480. The nature of drawing or pushing more clocks at a higher voltage is that it draws more power, but it was pretty competitive. So now what it looks like is happening is an RX 500X, which is a re-refresh, and that's probably going to be shaping up similarly. We're expecting a five to 6% improvement in performance overall, uh, Tweak Town's Anthony Gareffa has indicated that sources have told him 5-6%, to 6 which was consistent with what we would expect from a pre-overclocked RX 580, 
which is a pre-overclocked RX 480. So it's it's a pre over overclock basically. And that number makes sense, five to six percent if it comes out, which it probably will. Power consumption almost certainly will be higher as you'd expect. And the only other change, maybe they go with nine gigabit per second GDDR5 because it does exist, but at the memory prices today, doesn't make a lot of sense. So we'd expect GDDR5 at eight gigabits per second max for these cards and no other major changes except for the clocks. And uh, the 500 series was a partner only launch. So it's reasonable to suspect that the 500X series is probably a partner only launch and no reference cards will be made, but we'll see. Uh, probably no reference cards should be made because if they're overclocking a pre-overclocked card, it's gonna be a bit much for that reference cooler to handle. So yeah, in the very least, there's a letter on the end. So I'm not gonna get as mad as with the GT 1030, but it's still kind of silly. Uh, next one, Micron is building new 3D NAND fabs for 2020. So this is a news item I don't have to be enraged at. Micron has broken ground on the expansion of their Singapore campus. And this is with the intent of mass production of 3D NAND, which is used for things like SSDs. It's known as phase three because the campus has already begun the expansion process previously, twice actually. Construction is scheduled to be completed by quarter two of 2019, not far from now actually. And wafers are coming off the lines in quarter four of 2019 as well. So uh, volume and mass production expected on tap for 2020. Uh, maybe the memory prices will change at that time. We'll see. Next, Encore V1 has a Kickstarter page now. Uh, direct die cooling for LGA 1151 on this thing. The Encore V1 is a somewhat unique water block designed for delitted LGA 1151 socket CPUs. Interestingly, the Encore V1 eschews the IHS and drops in on top of the die without a frame. In the past, a frame has been required to mitigate the risk of cracking the die under the stress of mounting pressure in the absence of an IHS. For non-believers, there's a version of the Encore V1 that comes with a floating frame, offering a more traditional mounting experience. Additionally, the Encore V1 is available with a delitting tool compatible with LGA 1151 socket-based chips. The Encore V1 also touts adjustable water flow, with water flowing up to 20 times closer to the CPU package based on their Kickstarter page and Kickstarter videos, things like that. I don't know if we'll review this one. We do have their Bowers Direct Die Frame, which is a different product, but uh, we'll get around to that once we have a production version of it. Right now, it's just pre-production. Might visit this one if there's enough interest in it. And then finally, the next major news item here, Apple plans to replace Intel CPUs with their own chips in 2020. This is a recent report from Bloomberg, which suggests that Apple is intending to unload Intel as their CPU provider for Mac computers and suggesting that they will be going with an in-house design within the next two years. Apple sought a partnership with Intel back in 2006. However, Apple has been making moves to shed outside providers completely in what is ostensibly an ambition to control every single aspect of their devices. And Apple also dumped both Qualcomm and Imagination Technologies, who are now struggling quite a bit, to design and implement their own silicon for iPhones. Perhaps it was only a matter of time before Apple wanted custom solutions for all of their products. And according to Bloomberg, Apple represents roughly 5% of Intel's annual revenue, and Intel's stock prices fell 9.2% once the report broke. 5% is a big chunk of revenue. So if they lose out on that, it's, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, it remains to be seen whether AMD will have some sort of semi-custom solution as they've been marketing to a lot of vendors lately, including Intel, for future Apple products, but uh, the rumors indicate that Apple wants to take control of this and do it in-house. So I think that's it for this week's news recap. Uh, any additional items would be bad for blood pressure, so we'll cap it there. But I, I do really want to leave you with the GT 1030 and other rebranded products stories like the previous 560 that we talked about or 550 whatever it was if we could just not buy those that'd be good i, I think that would pretty much send the message that i want to be sent so uh if you see them hard pass that's it for this time thanks for watching subscribe for more go to patreon.com gamers nexus to help us out directly because uh I, I keep making manufacturers mad. So you can go there and help us out. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our new mod mats, which has the new matte black background. And we realized also it's 
got some more traction to it as a result. So pretty cool for modding stuff. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.